It was Jesus Christ himself who instituted what we know as the Lord's Supper near the end of his earthly life to ensure not only that his followers then, but to ensure that his followers throughout the years would remember what he was about to do to give his life so that our sins could be forgiven, he established the Lord's Supper. He established communion. Here, if you will, from the 14th chapter of Mark's gospel about the time that that happened. From Mark 14, verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus and his disciples gathered in an upper room there during the Passover feast. Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take it. This is my body. And then Jesus took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, Jesus said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. What was established there in that upper room has continued to be observed throughout the centuries by people past, present, and people in the future who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The Apostle Paul himself writes of that tradition in 1 Corinthians 11. Listen to how he expresses it. For I receive from the Lord, he writes, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Life is a book in volumes three. The past, the present, the yet to be. The past is written and laid away. The present we're writing day by day. The last and best of volumes three is locked from sight. God holds the key. The author of this anonymous poem expresses something that all of us experience. We might label them the three tenses of life, past, present, future. All of us here today have a past. Mine started February 10th, 1953. My youngest grandchild started November 30th, 2015. When did yours begin? Because whatever has happened to you from the time that you were born into this world until this very moment is actually your past. We learn from it. The good Lord knows we would like to go back and redo part of it. We all have a past. And part of what brings us together at this table today is the fact that our past, when it was good, when it's been bad, is something that can be redeemed by Christ, and it is. We also, who know Christ as Savior this morning, have a future. We call it heaven we label it our ultimate home. It is our hope which can keep us going even when the present moments are challenging. 
the future of heaven is promised. We also have now, the present. Perhaps your present is joyful and happy. Perhaps you come to the Lord's table today and your present is sad, discouraging, troubled. Whatever the case with your present today, God is present with you. He is for you. He loves you. And he will help you. So for just a few moments before we break bread, along with other Christians throughout the globe around this table, consider how the Lord's Supper elaborates on the three tenses of life. We all have a past. Our past can be forgiven. The reason that Jesus Christ came and gave himself, sacrificed his body, which was broken, his blood, which was shed, was so that our sins could be forgiven. He talks about that. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whatever your past, whatever you have done, if you will confess your sins, according to 1 John, Christ is faithful. He is just. He will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's good news today, ladies and gentlemen, whatever you've done, even if you don't feel worthy. None of us are. Your past can be forgiven. God forgives us through Christ of our transgressions. And yet, have you noticed, though the Bible tells us that God forgives us and will remember our sin no more, you and I, if we're not careful, kind of hold on to the memories of those past sins. We carry around a lot of guilt have a lot of burdens. I want you to know that if you come with a burden of guilt because of something that has happened in the past this morning, you can leave that guilt, that burden here and go out from this place without them because your past is forgiven. The story is told of two monks who belong to a very strict order. One of the rules of this particular order is that these brothers pledged to have no contact with women, to focus on the bride of Christ, the church. On one occasion, two of the monks were on a hike, they were on a walk, and they came upon a, a lady who was in distress. There was a swollen stream. She was almost ready to, to be drowned. She needed somehow to get to the other side and they looked around, there was no one else. And so they decided in that moment to break their vow. They picked up the woman by her arms, by her legs. They carried her across the stream. She was rescued. They continued on their journey but one of the brothers noticed that the other was troubled. He was agitated. He was so anxious and distressed. Brother, what's wrong with you? And the brother actually knew. And the wise brother said to his brother, I laid that woman down back there on the other side of the stream, you are still carrying her, put her down. Perhaps you're here today and you are still carrying some burden from the past. 
Jesus came and gave his life, ladies and gentlemen, so that your past could be forgiven. Put your burden down. Leave it here. Our past is forgiven. To skip ahead for just a moment, our future is secure. Have you ever noticed in the Lord's Supper passages the future dimension that is emphasized? In Mark's passage, which we read earlier, Jesus, after saying, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood which is said for you, goes on to say, truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Throughout the Bible, heaven, home, is often portrayed as a heavenly banquet where there will be a place for all of God's children, ample food for everyone there. Or as Paul liked to express it, when you here upon this earth eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God sent his son, he came, lived a perfect life, modeled God's love for us, died for us on the cross, was buried, was resurrected, ascended into heaven. But before doing so, told his apostles who were assembled in that upper room, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen to this. I go to prepare a place for you, Christ said. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And so often, ladies and gentlemen, it is the hope and the promise of a future which is secure, which enables us to get through the present, even when it's challenging. This past Friday at this church in the sanctuary, I preached the funeral of Bob Badgett. Since 2006, when Bob moved to Lexington and joined our church, having left Western Kentucky after his wife died because of cancer, Bob very regularly and faithfully would worship here in the sanctuary. He loved the feel of church. He especially loved the music. He loved the choir and the instruments and the congregational singing. He loved all kinds of music, they said. Bob finally had to give up his earthly life, his earthly battle. He, though he had worshiped with us earlier, even this summer, he succumbed to ill health. And just this past week, he, he passed to his heavenly home. But what was so telling about Bob that even through all of that that he had experienced in life, he had hope and trust. You see, Bob was a career Marine officer. He served in Korea, two tours in Vietnam. He was responsible for getting the wounded Marines on the helicopter to bring them back home. He was right there with his wife the entire time that she battled with cancer. And recently, during his own health struggles, he relied on God again. And this past week, while he was in Central or St. Joe Hospital, surrounded by his four adult children, there was a CD playing. And while the words of this song were being sung, 
Bob Badgett, who had always had the hope of heaven, passed to it. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, O sinner, come home. Bob Badgett went home this past week. He claimed the gift of heaven, which had been his future that gave him courage. He's enjoying life everlasting. He's home. Our past can be forgiven. Our future is secure, but that brings us back to now. Our present can be manageable. There's a theological mistake that a lot of Christians make. And this is what it is. They act like and sometimes perhaps even believe that eternal life is something that won't do you any good until you die and go to heaven. They could not be more biblically wrong. Eternal life is a dimension of life that you get the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do you remember how Christ expressed it? He said, I have come to earth, to you, to your present. I have come that you might have life. In the Greek there is zoe, it's eternal life and might have it more abundantly. You don't have to wait till you die. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've got eternal life now. Back in the 1980s, John Hancock Insurance Company had an ad that they ran on television. And I still remember the catchy phrase, John Hancock can help you here and now and not just in the hereafter. It was their way of saying that John Hancock was expanding out, not just life insurance, but through financial services, mutual funds. We can help you here and now, not just in the hereafter. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Jesus Christ around whose table we gather this morning will help you here and now. He can make your present manageable. Throughout the years, one of my favorite Guidepost Riders is a lady from Huntington, West Virginia. She is a nurse by profession. Her name is Roberta Messner. From the time that Roberta was a child, throughout her teenage years and now on up into her adult years, and she is about ready to retire after 38 years of nursing with the Veterans Administration, but throughout all that time, she has battled a condition known as neurofibromatosis. NF as an abbreviation. It's a condition that happens. It's very, very rare, but the nerve cells in one's body start to grow and produce benign but large, large tumors. The only way that you can deal with these disfiguring tumors is to have them surgically removed. If you've heard of the elephant man, he had NF. So throughout all of her life, Roberta Messner, follow the Lord Jesus Christ, somehow managed to get through, get this, 32 surgeries. 
32 surgeries, 32 tumors, which grew and at times made her disfigured. How easy it would have been for Roberta to have given up the fight, to say there's got to be more, but she continued to write, and her writing inspired so many people through the years. When she had her 32nd tumor and her 32nd surgery, her physician who had studied this condition developed a type of gel made out of her platelets and injected that into the place where this 32nd tumor had been removed, saying you should never have to worry about it again. But lo and behold, tumor number 33 appeared, and she was ready to end it. She had the prescription drugs right there. She took just one a day, but she had 33 of them, one for each tumor, and sat there on a Sunday evening at 7.30 saying, I can't take it anymore, and almost took them all, but something held her back. She went to work the next day, determined that she was going to carry through, that the pain was so great. But her supervisor said, Roberta, there's so someone here to, to see you. And she went to the supervisor's office, and there were two women that she had never met. A mother and daughter from Martinsville, West Virginia. Roberta, they said, we just had to meet you. Your devotionals have inspired us for years. And we have driven five hours today because we wanted to see you personally. I don't know how to explain it, Roberta, but last night, Sunday night, about 7.30, you were on our mind and we prayed and knew that we had to come. And they did. And Roberta's present was manageable. Going back through journals that she had kept, she noted that there were all kinds of those moments when just on the verge of giving up, when things seemed to not be able to get any better, God would send some person. She would receive a note, an encouragement, an extra job when finances were tight. Do you know what she calls those? Manna for the moment. God providing manna bread from heaven, just at the moment that she needed it, making her life manageable. Come to God's table this morning. Your past is forgiven. Leave your burdens here. Come to God's table this morning. Your future is secure. Heaven awaits you. Come to God's table this morning. Your present, even when it's challenging, is manageable because of what God has done for us in Christ. Shall we pray? Gracious Lord, be with us now as we partake of this communion meal. Remind us of our connection with you, our connection with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Remind us, O oh God, of all that you do for us and how blessed we are. In the name of Christ.